everyone to Krypton to Alderaan. I'm Joey and we're trying something a little bit different for this episode as I'm flying solo to bring you my analysis review of the Bad Batch season three premiere episodes confined, Paths Unknown and Shadows of Tantis. Y'all, I think this might be some of my favorite Star Wars. Let me explain why. Let me know what you thought of these episodes. I really loved the premiere and it's shaping up, like I said, to continue to be some of my favorite Star Wars, especially the first and third episodes, but I'm not gonna discount Paths Unknown. We still get a lot of story. We still get a lot of backstory. We still got a lot of heart and growth and heart and growth are my two favorite things about this show. I love heart and I love growth. So we pick up on Tantus seemingly not too long after they capture Omega and bring her there. And we see Emery come for Omega and start to include her on the work that they're doing there. And soon we learn that that work is some kind of cloning work in order to reproduce a genetic M count, which we have heard that language before. They are trying to tie in the Bad Batch to the Mando era to the sequel trilogy era. And not to get too far ahead here, but you know, I love jumping ahead, but Austin over at the Wayseekers pod, go listen to their podcast. They did a really great episode on the premiere. They do really great episodes on everything in general. But Austin asked a really interesting question, which was by getting more of a backstory into how Palpatine returned, essentially, do we think the Bad Batch will make the rise of Skywalker better, just to put it bluntly. I know plenty of people like The Rise of Skywalker. I know plenty of people don't like The Rise of Skywalker. I think probably a lot of people's knee-jerk reaction to this question would be like, no way, no, no way to make that better. But I think about The Clone Wars, the prequel trilogy is, in my opinion, made so much better by having watched the Clone Wars series that I hold off hope for that to be the same for people for the sequel trilogy. I don't hate the sequel trilogy. I like a lot of it. You know, The Rise of Skywalker is not my favorite thing. But if they can introduce this backstory, if they can continue to introduce these little moments to make, like we've talked about here before, to make a more complete saga, not just a series of trilogies, but combine everything into one long saga and fill in those gaps, I think it has the potential to uplift the stories that have already been told that maybe people didn't appreciate so much. So I but hold off hope. Let's hold off hope for that. Let's see where this goes. I really like this introduction of what we learn later is Project Necromancer, which we've also heard discussed in, uh, in The Mandalorian Season 3. So we're tying all of these things together, which is also really fun. Another thing I'm going to discuss a little bit later, I think when we get there, you know, so I don't keep getting ahead of myself, is Palpatine and Palpatine's presence in this show and how different that feels, I think, than previously. There is just so much to love here, in my opinion. We're, we're following Omega around the facility. We're seeing her kind of day to day. We see Crosshair and the other defecting clones being taken somewhere else, I believe, to a re-education facility that seems to be run by one of those clones assassins that we saw. There is nothing but somberness here in this first episode. There's hope for sure. Like Omega is is very hopeful. Every stronghold has a weak point. She believes that they will be able to escape, but the somberness is so there. I mean, everything's very dark. We see light a couple of times, but everything's very dark. We see her scratching the, like marking the days, marking the rotations, I should say, on her wall. By my count, by the end, about 160 days total that she spent on Tantis. But just the like somberness, we talked about this a little bit in our Ahsoka episodes of the silence, the moments of silence that give such feeling and gravity to these things. There's like, there's some music here in some of these scenes, but there's a lot of silence and just like weight given to the actual like conditions that they're facing and the somberness and the hopelessness that is surrounding Omega in this space where she continues to be a little bit of hope and a very wonderful person patching Batcher. I love it when Star Wars is nice to animals. I'm talking to you, Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor. Star Wars is nice when it is nice to animals. Seeing her like patch up Batcher and get a dog, basically adopt a dog is just so 
great. Another moment in this episode that I really love that uh, speaks to Omega's hope and Omega being kind of the catalyst for redemption and a positive influence is when she's talking to Crosshair about escaping. And Crosshair, immediately when he said this, I knew it was going to come back up later. You know, they're talking about escaping and he says, he said to Omega, if I get the chance to escape, I wouldn't hesitate to, to go without you or something like that. Buddy, come on. There's no way. I mean, come on. We knew that was going to come back to get him, right? Crosshair is just a big old softy at heart. It's very interesting because way back when at the end of season one, my opinion was that like, I just want Crosshair to kind of be the villain. I did not really appreciate the way it all went down in the finale of season one, but we're getting his redemption story, which Star Wars is all about. And I kind of dig it. And we're seeing him kind of at least start to try to make up for some of those things. And it's also kind of heartbreaking the amount of time that we end up seeing pass. Even in that first episode, we see so much time pass. You can clock it by the, the notches that Omega's putting on the wall. You can clock it by the her like hair growth into a ponytail. I also really, really dig the use of the centrifuge as like leading up to something. First of all, I think that sound effect is super cool. But also just using that as like a symbol for the clock ticking up to what eventually like becomes their escape. I don't know. I just thought that was really cool. I think it's cool. Is that so bad? Also finding out that Omega is special in some way that she has the blood that's necessary to produce the replication of the M count. But we then get into the second episode, Paths Unknown, which again, I really like. I think if there's one, maybe one minimal gripe I have with this like trilogy of premiere is that I kind of wish that the first and third episodes were back to back. And then the second episode was was after that. I don't I mean, maybe that's not a, the right way to contain the story, but I would have loved it if like the first episode blended into the third episode. As we transition into Paths Unknown, I had not considered before this that the only members of the squad left to be out there in the galaxy trying to figure stuff out would be Hunter and Wrecker. By themselves. We lost tech and Echo went off with Rex and Omega is captured and Crosshair is captured. I, uh, the end of last season, I gave no consideration to the fact that it would just be Hunter and Wrecker out on this mission by themselves, which at seeing at first glance, especially when they get back in the ship after handing the pike over to the Durans was kind of heartbreaking. You know, we don't get a break from this kind of somber tone. Hunter is very like melancholy throughout this, you know, he's as they're searching for Omega. We all know that I love the emotional storytelling of these shows, but it's heartbreaking. The somberness, the somber tone. I think that's the main my main thesis for these three episodes is it's just sad. And they do such a good job of like representing that in every aspect in the way the characters speak in the tone in which they speak in the music in the lack of music in the lighting in everything it's just heartbreaking except for kind of one moment at the end where wrecker is like having fun with the with the reg kid clones that they rescue but speaking of sad and speaking of the regs we get hunter and wrecker from the information that the durans give them to finding this planet, finding Hemlock's old base, and finding these abandoned kids that the Empire has thought they destroyed in an orbital bombardment, like they, they tried to blow up the base with kids inside. But not only do they find these reg kids, but the other, the adult regs, the soldiers following orders, abandoned these kids here without a second thought. And then helped the empire or were part in the empire bombing this facility with kids inside man good soldiers follow orders takes another big step now they're abandoned and they're living on their own in the wilderness of this planet the dangerous wilderness of this planet that is dangerous because the empire has been creating monsters cloning monsters like the Zillow Beast. They take Hunter and Rex back to their little cave. And my favorite of the regs is Mox. I assume short for Moxie. He also talks like a 1920s gangster going down there as a suicide mission. See? Anyway, we get Hunter and Wrecker going into this facility, being led into this facility that they, they think might have housed Omega at some point. The idea here is that Omega might have been there when they bombed this planet. They're led into the facility and we get to see the monsters 
that the Empire is creating. To what end? Uh, just so Palpatine has more powerful soldiers. But the main thing here, I think, is getting to see how much these characters have changed and grown. Like, Hunter is such a far cry from what we saw in season one and even part of season two when they first meet the Reg kids and he... The way Hunter says please to these kids when they're looking for Omega is heartbreaking. And we further get to see how far Hunter has come at the end. They're going to drop them off at Pabu. One of the kids says, you know, we're cadets without a war. We don't know where we fit in anymore. And touching on the theme that we at Krypton Alderaan discussed all last season of, of The Bad Batch, Hunter says, form your own path be something other than a soldier, which is just a testament to how far Hunter has come, which I don't think we really got until he got to Pabu last season. So I just love seeing that. I love the character development, taking this character from like leader of this squad in this war to now passing his, the wisdom that he's learned about like, it's okay to be more than a soldier, passing that on to like the next generation of people that were bred to be soldiers. Transitioning into episode three, Shadows of Tantis, we get back to Crosshair and Omega and we see how much time has passed. Again, we're back to this somber state. Nalase, we see that Nalase has been destroying Omega's blood samples because the Empire can't find out that she's a good candidate and Nalase knows that. So what exactly did Nalase do to create Omega in the first place? Did she play around with midichlorians? when creating Omega. Who knows? Hopefully we'll find out. But the bottom line is that she makes a good candidate. Her blood holds the key to replicating an M count without degradation in the sample, whatever that means. But in this episode, we get Palpatine. The scene that we saw in the trailer with Palpatine arriving on Tantus, we get that scene. And what I really love most about this, again, with like the gravity of everything that's going on on Tantus and everything that's going on with this storyline, the theme that plays for Palpatine and just his presence and the voice acting and his demeanor, it's just so heavy and ominous and eerie kind of scary honestly but such a change from the palpatine that we saw in the clone wars and other animated palpatine where some bits in the clone wars was kind of silly he was kind of a silly boy just jumping around fighting maul and savage and stuff doing sith magic and whatever else you know i love the clone wars we just get a little bit of silly boy palpatine in that here not nah, no we just get a very serious angry heavy Palpatine. But we also get to see behind the scenes in Project Necromancer, we don't actually get to see whatever they've got in those tubes or 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 whatever those are. But we do see some Sith language, some ur katat on the floor. So I'm also wondering if there's some Sith magic or some kind of ancient Sith thing that's needed in order to grow these or facilitate the transfer of you know the force into some of these clones it'll be super interesting to see that going forward hey if anyone has this translated i did not translate it if anyone knows what this says on the floor here let me know put it in the comments we'll talk about it but again i think the super important thing for me is them like connecting all of these different pieces of content between this and mando and eventually the sequel trilogy I love the idea of bridging this gap, like using animation and live action, TV and movies to create this one large cohesive story and that it all starts here. So maybe eventually we can stop using the somehow Palpatine returned meme. Wouldn't that be nice? And we see Omega and Crosshair escape the facility. I really love this dynamic between these two. I love like Crosshair just being like, He's just like negative the entire way. It's a really great dynamic. I really love it. When they realize that the emperor is there and he was like, this is the more, more indication that this is the wrong time to wing and escape. And Omega's like, well, we're already here. So stop crying about it. I just really love that dynamic. Up to the point, they are running through the forest and Omega trips and Crosshair goes back for her. He picks up the data pad, he goes and picks up Omega. Guess what? He didn't leave her behind when he had the opportunity because we're getting an actual good Star Wars redemption story here. I kind of am a little bit afraid that like the Empire's may might be creating like 
sleeper agents here with that re-education program. So hopefully the Bad Batch will not still be in danger of Crosshair turning on them. But in these moments, they're so good. And then he switches from that kind of annoying attitude. Oh, good. Great. The killer hounds. But then their backs are against the wall. Omega's plan didn't work. She apologizes and he says, you got us this far and we're not done yet. And then plan 72, they work together and they get it done. But in that moment, he's like, don't worry about it, kid. We can get through this. You got us this far. Thank you. He completely changes his demeanor. That is the perfect bow tied on this little arc. Such a good dynamic. I really love this. I can't wait to see. I really hope that they interact that way more. And I can't wait to see everyone unite. But that's it. That's the end of the episode. The Empire is hunting them down. They know that Omega is the key to replicating the M count without degradation. So we'll see how they track them down with the infinite resources of the Empire at Hemlock's disposal. But I love this show. I really enjoyed these episodes. I have no complaints, as you could hear, other than, hey, like I said, a minimal thing is I kind of wish one and three were back to back. But that's not anything. I love this cloning monsters or creating monsters storyline. I really, I want to see more of that. I want to see what the point of that is. I am so excited for the rest of the season, and I'm excited to hear from all of you. What did you think of all three episodes? Let me know in the comments. Let me know what you think of this idea of the potential to uplift the sequel trilogy, or at least the rise of Skywalker, by continuing to build that backstory out now, flush that backstory out now. I know, I know, I know a lot of your knee-jerk reactions are going to be nothing can make The Rise of Skywalker better. And let's be a little bit more generous. What do you think? Royce and I will be back doing these weekly as more episodes come out. So tune back in for more. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on our continued review of the series. Let's keep the conversation going in the comments. Hit us up on social media. Just search Krypton to Alderaan anywhere. We can have the conversation there as well. I've been Joey. I freaking love this show. And I'll catch you next time on Krypton to Alderaan.